everybody can do their bit. I mean, there you are sitting on the other side of the world from where all the pangolins are, and and you're helping you're helping them. So if everybody did something, it would all add up and make a huge difference. So thank you very much. Welcome to Nature's Guardians. I'm Micah Siegel. Each week, I talk with people working to save and help animals around the world. They are nature's guardians, and you can become one too. Today, I'm talking with Nikki Wright of the African Pangolin Working Group. Welcome to the show, Nikki. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, pleasure to have you. Yeah, where are you? I'm based in Johannesburg, which is in South Africa, so I'm just outside of Johannesburg. Johannesburg's fairly central in the in the whole country of South Africa, so I can I could travel easily and and often do. It's six o'clock in the evening here, um, yeah. so the sun's going down and uh, it's all nice and peaceful. And we're we're in the middle of our summer here, so it's probably about twenty five degrees centigrade here. So, what should we know first about pangolins? Pangolins have been on the planet for about 84 million years, they say. So they've been on the planet a long time, just quietly minding their own business and evolving. I mean, who's ever heard of a scaled mammal? And this is what they are. They're the only mammal on earth that has scales. And as you know, their scales are uh, not scaled like a reptile scales or like a snake scales, which is all one um, the, the sort of uniform. But they're separate hard scales, which um, are made of keratin. And that has uh, that gives them their, their amazing armor. So when they roll up, they've got an incredibly strong uh, core muscles and a very, very strong tail um, that, that keeps them all rolled up. And they're absolutely impenetrable when they're, when they're big pangolins. When they're little pangolins, they do make a tasty snack for a honey badger. Or a hyena, because they they're too small to keep that that ball rolled up. There are there are eight species of pangolin on the planet. Yeah, um, and they're all in the in the order called Folidata. So um, you have four species in Asia, and you've got four species here on the African continent. The one that I work with in South and Southern Africa is called the Temminx pangolin. And it's the chap that trots along on its back feet, balanced with its tail, just like this picture. There's little front front feet are, are up like this, uh, like a mini T-Rex, really. They really do look like little dinosaurs. And then you've got the giant pangolin, which is up in the deep rainforests of the Congo in Central Africa. And they can weigh up to 35 to 40 kgs, kilos. And then you've got the little... Um, arboreal pangolins, which are the ones that, that live in the trees in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. White-bellied, black-bellied pangolin. So why are pangolins? So what's the story with you and pangolins? How did you get to working with pangolins? <laughs> um, I was running a wildlife rehabilitation facility for many, many years. And um, in 2007, somebody called me to reception um, because there was this sack that had been brought in. Um, and inside the sack was this pangolin. And I we got the pangolin out of the sack and um, sort of held it. And I didn't know how to hold it. I didn't know. You know, it was just such a strange, strange animal to hold. They're, they're very hard and very strong. But they're underneath, if they open up, is very, um, they've just got this lovely soft pink belly. Um, big claws. I mean, some of their claws are as long as my fingers. Um, and I'd never dealt with the pangolin before. So that was in 2007. And we sorted that pangolin out. Um, and it was the first one that I'd had come in off the, off the illegal wildlife trade. And then, um, that's how it started basically. So it started very slowly and, and eventually we were dealing with more and more and more of them. Tell us some stories about pangolins. I mean, it sounds a bit corny to say they're unique animals because every animal is unique, right? Yeah. But they really are. There isn't anything else alive on the planet like a pangolin. So they're nocturnal. Um, they're covered in hard scales. They sleep in burrows or up in trees. 
they, they're not aggressive. They, they've got no teeth, so they can't bite. Um, they've just got a big st- a tail that can that can slap you if if you if they get scared. But they don't come at you and try and um, attack you or anything like any other sort of animal would at all. So they're quite peaceful animals. Um, and they've just got this incredibly long tongue. It's probably like that, as long as a ruler, I would say, in total for an adult animal. And it's very, very sticky on their, on their, inside their chest. Just here, they've got these um, big salivary glands and they make saliva or spit that is incredibly sticky. If you get some on your finger and you do that, you can see the strands, you know, like if you do it with glue, it's like that, very sticky. Because obviously there's that, that tongue goes down all the holes and all the ants get stuck to it. So tell us about the first time you saw a pangolin in the wild. The first time I saw a pangolin in the wild was in one of my favorite, favorite places, and that was in the Kalahari. The Kalahari is is enormous, you know, huge big sky, and it's got these huge big red dunes, um, and you've got pangolins living in there as well. And they live in deep burrows that they share with artfarks, which are another amazing animal. I don't know if you've heard of an artfark. Um, and they also eat ants and termites. Um, and, yeah, they, they survive in the desert fairly well. And that was the first time I'd seen one, which was a magical, very moving experience because it's in this incredible place. And then you've got this unbelievable animal, which I'd seen in in captivity, obviously dealing with them off the trade. But this was the first wild one I'd ever seen, and and it's it moves you to tears. You know, it's it's such a it's such an incredible thing. You'll feel something like that when you see your first rhino when you come to Africa, when you come to South Africa, when you do come, or your first elephant in the wild. It's very moving. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite stories. Um, is uh, a, a pangolin called Tater. So she was a female who came in. And when they come into the veterinary hospital, they all get a, an, the females get an ultra uh, sound scan to see if they've got a baby. And she was pregnant and she was, her pregnancy was quite advanced. Um, and one morning, and she was very, very ill. And one morning we opened her box to check on her. And there was this tiny little pup that had been born in the night. But unfortunately, because Tater was so uh, compromised, she didn't have enough milk and couldn't feed her baby. So I hand reared that baby and I called her Tot. And Tot basically lived with me for eight months while I was hand rearing her and then rehabilitating her, showing her ants, trying to teach her how to eat ants, which is quite tricky, you know, when you're not an ant eating species yourself. But those things are all instinctive and they all, in, uh, these, these babies know instinctively what to do. So you've just got to take them and show them. And it involves walking, walking the pangolins every single day so that they can feed sometimes for up to six hours um, a day to get enough ants in their, in their diet every day and put on enough weight. And with Tot, of course, when she was very tiny, she was 236 grams when she was born. Um, and when she was very tiny, she used to be fed milk with a bottle sort of every two to three hours around the clock. So it was very tiring waking up all that time, feeding the baby pangolin and then walking her when she was old enough, walking her, you know, out in the, in the, um, savanna for her to feed when she, when she started feeding. So that was one of my favorite stories. And she taught me a lot. You know, I learned a lot from her. And then there have been some remarkable stories of, of pangolins that have been in really bad situations um, that we've managed to get right and then, and then release them again. Um, and, and we still know where they are because they have telemetry on them. So we can follow them and monitor them years down the line. Um, and you get very attached to each pangolin. So give us an overview of the four species. Where are they and how many are they? Well, the four species that we have in Africa are the Temminx pangolin, which is the one that we have in Southern Africa. But the, the range of that pangolin goes all the way up to Southern, uh, Southern Sudan. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we've got the giant pangolin, which is in the forests of Central Africa. 
And then we've got the black-bellied pangolin and the white-bellied pangolin, which are in West and Central Africa. Yeah, numbers. How are they doing? We don't know. Because, I mean, you can you can have, I know people that have been going into Kruger Park every year for their three-week holiday for 30 years, and they've never seen, they've never come across a pangolin. And it's not because they're not there, but it's just because they're so elusive. How does poaching happen? Because, like you said, it's very, very difficult to find one. Yeah. Um, well, what we think is that um, down here in Southern Africa, the pangolins that we work with the Temmings pangolin are poached and sold alive. And um, we think that there are herd boys in, in all the rural areas looking after their cattle or looking after their goats. And so when they get somebody else coming into their area saying, we'll give you a hundred bucks if you find us one of these and they show a picture of a pangolin, they'll say, oh yeah, now I know where one comes through here or goes to live in that hole or whatever it is. And, and that's how they find them. Up in West, <clears throat> West and Central Africa, it works, it works differently. They don't deal with live pangolins there. They kill them, and then they take the scales off them. So what do people use the scales for? Well, the scales are used in Africa um, for traditional medicine. Um, but the scales now are, are all um, sold or, or taken overseas to Asia by the ton load um, for the Asian demand, mainly China, but also Vietnam and other Asian countries um, use the scales for a, a, a myriad of different um, traditional medicine uses. So in China, the, um, the traditional medicines are produced, you know, on a pharmaceutical scale, huge, big um, factories produce the, the medicines. Um, and the, the pangolin scale can be one of several different ingredients in a little bottle of powder or capsules or something, whatever it is. Does it, does it actually work? Does it have any like actual benefits? No. Sci well, scientifically, <clears throat> um, the scientists don't think it has any medicinal, um, benefit, but, um, you know, it's difficult to tell somebody whose entire culture is based on those beliefs. And this goes back to sort of 800 AD. Um, it's very difficult to try and convince somebody who so deeply believes that that thing will work for um, whatever it is that they're trying to treat. Maybe people believe it enough to make it work. You know, people say mind over matter. Maybe maybe that's what, what happens in China. I don't know. Um, but from a scientific basis, it has no medicinal benefit at all. It's like eating your fingernails. What does your organization do to stop this sort of things? We've been um, going since 2011, and we've worked on a, on a variety of different things, um, from getting involved with the sting operations, um, at one time quite heavily involved with that, to testifying in court um, in poaching cases, um, to the re finding finding good release sites, um, supplying telemetry for each pangolin that gets released, so that we know that the pangolin survives and and does well. Um, we do a lot of education um, programs, um, and we also uh, do a lot of workshops. So the workshops that we do are for law enforcement officers, for um, border officials. So people might come through a border post with a I don't know, a box of pangolin scales or a sack of pangolin scales, and the border officials have to know what it is. They have to know what they're looking at. And also they have to know if they arrest that person, what can they charge them with? So they have to, you know, those those are all things that we discuss in, in various workshops. Um, and also assisting our government and our law enforcement officials on different things, putting legislations together, putting guidelines together, and that kind of thing. Because this, this poaching crisis that's been happening with, with pangolins has happened um, quite fast in, in, in Africa and in South Africa. So we've had to learn really fast. We've had to learn all about um, you know, how, to, how to prosecute a case with a pangolin in it. 
um, for instance, because it hadn't been done before. Um, and we had to learn really fast how um, veterinarians can best treat pangolins. And the vets had to learn really fast because it was this weird animal that they'd never treated before. Even wildlife vets had never treated pangolins before. So everybody's had to hit the ground running and, and learn as much as they can about this very odd little animal to try and save them. So how many people are in your organization and do you do any scientific research? We've got four board members at the moment. And yes, we do do scientific research, not ourselves, but we sponsor, at the moment, we're sponsoring two um, PhD students. Um, the one guy, Francois, works up in the Limpopo region of South Africa, which is up north near Zimbabwe. And he is studying, he's doing his PhD on um, various aspects of pangolins once they've been poached and rehabilitated and once they've been released. So he's looking at that and how they how they do after they've been released. And then um, we've got a PhD student um, called Jessie who's down in KwaZulu-Natal. In fact, she's in Zululand um, on a reserve called Pinda. And we've released, um, I think it's 21 pangolins there in total. 17 have survived. And she's uh, that started that project started five years ago because in that whole region pangolins were extinct there locally extinct and they hadn't been seen there for four decades so that's over 40 years so we've put them back there and they've collated all the information with the um, using the, the telemetry and also observations watching the pangolins and now jesse is putting all that information together in her into her phd so we'll know what it's, you know, that that project can be used like a, a blueprint or a template for any other regions where the pangolins have gone extinct. I think it started off possibly in the very beginning where poachers were uh, poverty-stricken people that were poor, and then they got offered money for the scales. Um, this is in Western Central Africa, um, where you know, pangolins were were a, a bushmeat item. So, so you know, people eat a lot of wildlife, and um, they would sometimes catch pangolins and they would kill them and they would put them up as bushmeat, and then they would just discard the scales. The scales were just rubbish and they were over there in a pile. And then um, people from Asia arrived and said, "Can we have those?" and and then started offering them money. And of course, then that became the commodity. So that's what people were catching pangolins for now, the scales, because they bought them so much money, much more than the meat did. So it, it switched from being a, a food item to being an item that we can use and sell for scales. And I think, I think in the end, what's happened is that it's become poaching, not just to feed yourself and your family, which one can empathize with, but it's become hardcore full-scale poaching just for money so i think it's be, it's been driven by extremely ruthless um cruel and greedy syndicates how many of the poachers or middlemen have been put in jail in south africa a lot a lot um and a lot of them are getting 10 years which is the maximum um jail sentence they can get uh, because pangolins are, um, they're highly protected in South Africa under our laws. Um, so the maximum is a, a 10 year jail, t jail sentence or a million rand fine. Uh, sorry, 10 million rand fine. Um, so a lot have been getting their 10 year sentence. Um, pangolin are actually more protected by law in this country than rhino are. And that's because you can buy and sell rhino. But uh, pangolins are Appendix 1 under CITES. So you can't buy and sell them at all. So that gives them another level of protection. Do you have any stories about catching poachers? There was one sting operation. I wasn't on it, but I heard about it. And we also got the pangolin afterwards. There was an old Mercedes-Benz car in a um, an informal uh, settlement. And... The poachers were behind that car and they were firing at the law enforcement officers. 
So there was guns, guns going off, and eventually the poachers got um, arrested and handcuffed. And the guys got to the car, and there was the pangolin curled up on the back seat, completely unharmed. The bullets had gone right through the back seat but missed the pangolin. And that pangolin we called Benz, after Mercedes Benz. And he did he did very, <laughs> very well. And he he particularly liked a very big, fierce ant called Matabele ants, which when they bite you, you really know about it. But that was his favorite ant. So I drove him right to the north of, of South Africa um, and released him up there where those ants occurred. Mm -hmm. He's one lucky penguin. The other thing is because the poachers don't know uh, what pangolins eat, um, you'll often find a pangolin in a box or a sack with a couple of cabbage leaves because they just don't know what they eat. So they chuck a couple of cabbage leaves in. So you'll often open the sack and there's a pangolin looking at you with a pangolin uh, with a cabbage leaf on his head, you know, and you, you just feel so desperately sorry for them. They're so confused and so traumatized. Do you think the laws need to change in any parts of Asia or Africa? Um, well, the thing is that the laws are in place. Um, in Africa, a lot of the African countries have got very good conservation laws. In a lot of countries, there's a lot of corruption. So you'll get officials turning a blind eye because they get paid off. You know, um, money talks, unfortunately. And for a lot of these people, it's not this amazing, unique animal that it is to you and I. It's just a commodity. So it's like selling, it's like selling a gold watch. It means nothing to them. So mm -hmm. that's that's the difference. Do zoos get pangolins or no? Um, a lot of pangolin species don't eat in captivity. They have to go out and um, feed naturally. Um, however, there are some there are some um, uh, Asian species in zoos in the Taipei Zoo. They're doing um, using them for a lot of research, obviously to learn about them. Uh, the Prague Zoo has a has pangolins, Asian pangolins, and there are pangolins in a couple of zoos in in the U.S., which came from from Africa. Some white-bellied pangolins. What do you see for the next 30 years for pangolins in Africa? I think it's going to be very tough for pangolins in the next 30 years. And I'm hoping against hope because a lot of people have said that they think pangolins might be extinct in 10 years' time. And I'm hoping against hope that um, all the, the scientists and all the veterinarians and all the law enforcement officers and everybody who is working towards it are, are in time and that we can work smart and quick enough um, to save all the species of pangolin. The IUCN um, is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and it's, um, it's, a, it's an enormous organization, and they have different um, departments or different groups for different species. And there's a pangolin one, a pangolin specialist group, and it started in 2012, with, I mean, maybe a dozen members. And now it's got over 150 members. Um, and these are all scientists and rehabilitation specialists and field workers and police and all kinds of different people all over the world who are rooting for and working really hard to find solutions for the whole pangolin crisis and learning as much as they possibly can about pangolins. So we've got to put our faith in all of those people um, and hope that they come up with some bright ideas really fast to save them. So what will you be doing for the next um, 10 years to help pangolins? I think we'll be carrying on doing what, what, what we have been doing, you know, helping um, people research. We have to preserve habitat and we have to work with communities and we have to work scientifically to get a, a, a really good understanding of the, of the species that we're trying to save. Thanks for talking with me, Nikki. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for asking me on. And, um, you know, just everybody can do their bit. I mean, there you are sitting on the other side of the world from where all the pangolins are. 
and and you're helping you're helping them so if everybody did something it would all add up and make a huge difference so thank you very much that's why i'm going to thank you for watching you can help animals by hitting the like button and subscribing to this channel i'll see you next time on nature's guardians bye